to be understood from that. When we go around trying to determine the quality of our of our faith, of our life, of how we're raising our children, of how we are, how we're even doing in this world. If we're determining it by what other people think, um, we're setting ourselves up for failure because there's always going to be one Yahoo somewhere that's got a different opinion than what you have with regards to any number of things. And if we are not confident enough in ourselves to figure out that uh, we're doing okay of our own accord. And I've heard it said best that when we, when we stop playing the walk on role in somebody else's production, we can then begin to be the star in our own life. And that's what most people do. They play a walk on role in somebody else's life, responding to, and it starts with our parents. We're conditioned by our parents to talk, you know, how we act as children, uh, we're the, we are the walk-on stars or the walk-on characters in their in their life. They're the star of their production, and they're playing a walk-on role in their parents' lives, and it goes on and on. And we become conditioned to act in that way. And the Havamal tells us less safe by far is the wisdom found that is hid in another's heart. <laughs> so when we're walking around trying to determine what we're supposed to be happy about, how we're supposed to judge the quality of our lives and our faith and all this other stuff, if we're doing it by the yardstick of other men, uh, we're fooling ourselves in no uncertain terms. And I was looking over all that and I was preparing what I was going to talk about tonight and I came across the Grimness Mall. I think it's, I think it's important that we, that we look at this because I've gone through almost all of the, well, the majority of the important poems of the Poetic Edda and some of the prose Edda. But I haven't discussed this one. But it, stu it stood out to me tonight as I was going through picking up, picking up what I wanted to talk about, the Ballad of Grimnir. And as I read through it, I think you'll understand what I'm talking about. But I do want to read the introduction because this is one of the old poems. This is one of the ones that was put to paper, pen to paper in the 10th century. The Grimness Mall follows the Vafruthness Mall in the Codex Regius and is also found complete in the Armagnanion Codex, where also it follows the Vafruthness Mall. Snorri quotes over 20 of its stanzas. Now, there's a number of poems that Snorri quotes that we have no record of. There's two books missing from the Codex Regius, and there's several other things. And a lot of people have issues with Snorri, but we have to remember is he was the presiding judge of the all thing in Iceland in his little district at that time. And he's the one that put them on paper. And perhaps he put them on paper, seeing what was to come with the advent of the church and the wholesale destruction it was creating in many of the other um, indigenous and tribal beliefs. Like the preceding poem, the Grimness Mall is largely encyclopedic in nature, means it kind of covers everything and consists chiefly of proper names. And the last 47 stanzas containing no less than 225 of these. That's a lot. It is not, however, in dialogue form. As Muhlenhoff pointed out, there is underneath the catalog of mythological names a consecutive and thoroughly dramatic story. Odin, concealed under the name of Grimnir, is through an error tortured by King Garoth. It's not an error. He was hoodwinked and bamboozled and suckered into doing something because he wasn't completely secure in his in his spirituality, his faith, so whatever. He was built on a lie, and we'll get into that. Bound between two blazing fire, he begins to display his wisdom for the benefit of the king's little son, Agnar, who has been kind to him. Now, Agnar is the name of Garros' brother. Gradually, he works up to the great final moment when he declares his true name, or rather names, to the terrified Garros, and the latter falls on his sword and is killed. Now, I would love to be able to do it how they did it in, uh, in American Gods, but I don't quite have that skill. But you can just imagine that, and I think it would be good for the moment. <clears throat> when Odin reveals his name with Easter, and she does her magic work at the end of the second season. Is, uh, I love that scene. Mostly because I went to school with Christian Chenoweth. <clears throat> for much of this story, we do not have to depend on guesswork. For in both manuscripts, the poem itself is preceded by a prose narrative of considerable length, 
and concluded by a brief prose statement of the manner of Gareth's death. These prose notes, of which there are many in the Eddic manuscripts, are of considerable interest to the student of early literary forms. And we have to understand that this is some of the earliest literature penned in Europe. Presumably they were written by the compiler to whom we owe the Eddic collection, who felt that the poems needed such annotation or, in order to be clear. Now, there's a lot of annotation in this one in particular, and I'm going to read all of them. Linguistic evidence shows that they were written in the 12th or 13th century. So it's something along the lines of us taking the Declaration of Independence and writing it down and putting all the notes in there, such as legal determinations. It's something along those lines. But this has to do with the spirituality. Um, our political views are going to be as radically different from the signers and the compilers of the Declaration of Independence as these men probably were from the men that put down these poetic, these edits to, to paper. <laughs> Linguistic evidence shows, there we go, that they were written in the 12th or 13th century for they preserved none of the older word forms which help us to date many of the poems two or 300 years earlier. Without discussing in details the problem suggested by these prose passages, it is worth noting first that the Eddic poems contain relatively few stanzas of truly narrative verse, and second, that all of them are based on narratives which must have been more or less familiar to the hearers of these poems. So we're talking about an oral tradition. What did this sound like for thousands of years before this was put to paper as elders sat around a campfire in the middle of winter and began to discuss right and wrong action with the young people that were coming up in the community. Because when you get at the end of the day, this, this story has got to serve some kind of purpose for it to last this long. These elders had to tell these tales to these children for a reason. Otherwise it wouldn't have been saved. Much less a, a thousand years later, we're still discussing it after it's been put to paper. Without discussing in detail the, the problems suggested by these prose passages, <laughs> let's see, I already read that. In other words, the poems seldom aimed to tell stories, although most of them followed a narrative sequence of ideas. So it's not telling a story, what's it doing? It's offering instruction. The stories themselves appear to have lived in oral prose tradition, just as in the case of the sagas and the prose notes of the manuscripts insofar as they contain material, not simply drawn from the poems, poems themselves, are relics of this tradition. The early Norse poets rarely conceived verse as a suitable means for direct storytelling. And in some of the poems, even the simplest action is told in prose links between dialogue stanzas. They're conveying a message that goes beyond the telling of the story. Because how would you ensure the accurate transmission of such important lessons through the ages? The story will change. I can tell Greg a story, and by the time it gets to Brandy, it's going to be something entirely different. But to memorize these kind of prose stanzas and dialogues, that's another thing. That is the realm of traditional spiritual leaders of the community, a sacred, a sacred trust. So that if I went from one part of wherever, in Sweden or Scandinavia or wherever, and then went to another part, these holy men would have memorized and, and kept the same, same tradition because they'd memorized it as a part of the deal. Same thing with the Rig Veda, same thing with the Indian holy men. Long before the Rig Veda was put down the paper in the 12th century, these men memorized this stuff for thousands of years as an accurate way to communicate this holy tradition. The applications of this fact, which have, have been too often overlooked, are almost limitless, for it suggests a still unwritten chapter in the history of ballad poetry and the so-called popular epic. It implies that narrative among early peoples may frequently have had a period of prose existence before it was made into verse, and thus puts, for example, a long series of transitional stages before such a poem as the Iliad. In any case, the prose notes accompanying the Eddic poems prove that in addition to the poems themselves, there existed in the 12th century a considerable amount of narrative tradition. Well, shit, yeah, people couldn't read. Presumably in prose form, on which these notes were based by the compiler. Interpolations in such a poem as the Grimna Small could have been eas made easily enough, and many stanzas have undoubtedly crept in from other poems, but the beginning and the end of the poem are clearly marked. 
and presumably has come down to us with the same essential outline it had when it was composed, probably in the first half of the 10th century. That's an important thing to consider. King Hrothjung had two sons. One was called Agnar and the other Geroth. Agnar was 10 winters old and Geroth eight, so a younger brother. Once they both rode in a boat with their fishing gear to catch little fish and the wind drove them out into the sea. In the darkness of the night, they were wrecked on the shore and going up, they found a poor peasant with whom they stayed through the winter. The housewife took care of Agnar and the peasant cared for Geroth and taught him wisdom. In the spring, the peasant gave him a boat and when the couple led them to the shore, the peasant spoke secretly with Geroth. They had a fair wind and they came to their father's landing place. Geroth was first forward in the boat. He leaped out on land, but pushed out the boat and said, go thou now where evil may have thee. The boat drifted out to sea. Geroth, however, went up to the house, house and was well received, but his father was dead. Then Geroth was made king and became a renowned man. So the texts of the two manuscripts differ in many minor details. Hrothung, this mythical king, is not mentioned anywhere else. Geroth, the manuscript, spells his name in various ways. Frigg, obviously, is Odin's wife. She and Odin nearly always disagree in some such ways, the one outlined in this story. There's an important thing to consider in the development of relationships and the manner of communication. Kaliskjalf, gate shelf, Odin's watchtower in what they call the heaven, for lack of a better term, which he can overlook all the nine worlds. Grimnir means the hooded one. So when this woman raises the boy, this housewife raises the older boy, and the peasant, the man, who obviously had dreams of his own, um, whispered things into the ears of the younger one, so convincingly so that he betrayed his younger brother and took the kingship for himself, or his older brother. But it didn't, uh, it didn't leave him because he named his son after his brother. So sometimes if we want to be successful in this world, and there are many people out there that, that talk about being successful, they talk about the sacrifices of family. You can watch people such as Dan Pena, the $50 billion man, and he will tell you in no uncertain terms, there is no such thing as a work-life balance. If you're gonna be successful in this world, and the Havamal says, the man needs to get his butt out of bed early if he wants to get another man's wealth or his sheep. It's true. If you're not going to, if you're gonna be successful in this life, you're gonna be king. You're not gonna have time to go to your daughter's dance or your son's football game. You're gonna work, you're gonna sleep in your office. If you wanna build the truly kind of generational wealth that people so often talk and dream about, um, it requires a lot of effort can't simply just talk about it. You've got to commit to it. And sometimes that means telling your wife or your husband, look, I'm not going to be there tonight. I got to work. I got to get this done. And that's the kind of hard nosed commitment um, that you see among the truly successful. I don't care. You look at any of the wealthiest individuals in the world, unless they're royalty, Oprah, you know, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett, these people slept in their office many times. These people focused on building success for themselves. That was their primary goal. <laughs> it's also the primary goal of Gareth. He's been convinced by this peasant that this is a worthwhile thing to do, that being a king will make up for the loss of his brother. But somehow it bleeds through in this narrative tale because he names his son Agnar after his lost brother. His brother just goes off in the wilderness. I have a real problem with that. Now, I understand people want to be successful, but when you've been gifted a life to bring into this world, you have a responsibility to that. When I sit and I look at my daughter at 49, and she's eight, there's a real stunning realization that sometimes when I look around, I have to realize I'm all she's got. And I think many parents fail to realize that. I know that when I was young, I didn't realize that. And I sacrificed those relationships with my son 
to be successful, and I was. I don't hold the line. I think there are many ways to be successful. If you want to bulldoze through the business world and give it all you got and sacrifice everything about you to, to become successful and then live the easy life, go ahead. But when you bring a child into the world, you've got another responsibility. And I think it a bad thing to sacrifice that because how many times have we heard tales of, of kids that go into the foster care system or are taken care of by a step parent or everybody's left behind and there's resent, resentment and emotion. We are all these children have. And that's, and, that's, and that's the most important thing that I could possibly do at this point. Yes, I will enjoy some success because I have a talent. I have a gift. People need to find that. They need to figure out what to do. They might have a mechanical aptitude. I happen to be able to have a pretty good mechanical aptitude. I've been able to utilize it to make a lot of money in this world. I can also talk a lot. <laughs> and that helps out. <laughs> but I, I think that we, we're looking at something there. Garoth sacrificed this relationship with his brother to become king. Are we to look at that as a good thing or a bad thing? I would submit to you that if we look at that, we might consider that almost an evil thing. Because that boy depended on his brother as they were lost in the wilderness. Now, he was raised by the, by the woman, right? <clears throat> so Gareth was made king. Odin and Frigg are paying attention to all this. They sat in Hlithgjalf and looked over all the worlds. Odin, Odin said, Seest thou Agnar, thy fosterling, how he begets children with a giantess in the cave? But Geroth, my fosterling, is a king and now rules over his land. Frigg said, he is so miserly that he tortures his guests if he thinks that too many of them come to him. Odin replied that this was the greatest of lies, and they made a wager about this matter. Frigg sent her maidservant Fulla to Geroth. She bade the king beware lest a magician who was come thither to his land should bewitch him and told this sign concerning him that no dog was so fierce as to leap at him. That was a very great slander that King Gareth was not hospitable. And indeed, as we can look through all of Tacitus and our nine noble virtues, hospitality is really important. But nevertheless, he had them take the man whom the dogs would not attack. But let's go back, let's jump back real quick. That uh, Odin points out, seest thou Agnar, thy fosterling, how he begets children with the giantess in the cave. Um, what if he's happy? What if he's perfectly content living in that cave with those children? He's committed to raising those children. So his wife might be kind of a simpleton, a simple savage. Um, he's figured out how to pick somebody out to help him make it through this world. And I'm going to tell you right now, sometimes, I'm going to just tell you the only, what I, where I heard it. I remember sitting there, blubbering like a titty baby because some girl didn't love me anymore blah 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 and my uncle looked at me in no uncertain terms he said do you think that i am married to that simple savage back there in that room because we're in love he said no he said the world is a tough place and you better figure out someone that you can get along with to help each other make it through it there's a lot to be said for that <laughs> I, it kind of makes me sad that that's all my uncle ever found. And there are other people that have stuck together through thick and thin and made it through this world. I think there's a place for it. But I think to get to that place, there's an awful lot of work that has to be done on ourselves to be vulnerable enough to express how we feel about someone else and not have it used against us. The world shows us a bunch of things. But I see Agnar he begets children with a giantess in a cave. I got to tell you, sometimes I look at that. He hasn't drawn the ire of the gods. In fact, he's got the protection of Frigga herself. Now, Garoth, he's drawn some attention, and it may not always be the good thing. He's got Frigg and Odin making a bet over what he's worth. He built a foundation on deceit. He built a foundation of his kingdom on deceit and treachery. And my grandpa always said that behind every great fortune is the shadow of a lie. Well, here you have it, a shadow of a lie. And it draws the attention of the divine. <laughs> I think some people would call that weird. 
Um, when we weave that web, if you put a weak knot into it, it will unravel. So they secured Grimnir, and the king had him tortured to make him speak and set him between two fires. And he sent there eight knights. King Gareth had a son, 10 winters old, and called Agnar after his father's brother. Well, he's named this kid. He misses his brother. You miss those family relations when you do something wrong and break that. Be not the first to break with friendship. It will eat at your heart, it says it in Avalon. And here we have part of that. <laughs> Agnar went to Grimnir and gave him a full horn to drink from. It said that the king did ill in letting him be tormented without cause. So this 10-year-old boy, he understands right from wrong. You know, and quite frankly, when we see people get in these tight spots, we need to understand even a dog knows when right from wrong. If it goes over and poops on the floor and you say something to it, it's going to tuck its tail between its legs. It's going to leave the room. It knows it's done wrong. And I think it's a, I think it's one of the shallowest things when people say, well, I didn't know. Everybody knows right from wrong. And it takes courage and honesty to live that. This little boy has the courage to go up and take care of someone who's being mistreated. And he gives him a drink. Agnar went to Grimnar and gave him a full horn to drink from and said that the king did ill in letting him be tormented without cause. Grimnir drank from the horn, and the fire had come so near that the mantle burned on Grimnir's back. Now he begins to talk. Hot art thou fire, too fierce by far. Get ye now gone, ye flames. The mantle is burnt, though I bear it aloft, and the fire scorches the fur. I'm pretty sure he's probably got control over some of that. Twixt the fires now eight nights have I set, and no man brought meat to me, save Agnar alone, and alone shall rule Gareth's son over the Goths. Hail to thee, Agnar, for hail to thou art by the voice of Veritir. For a single drink shalt thou never receive a greater gift as a reward. Now he's not talking. He's already told him he's going to make him king. Now he's offering another gift. And this is not the first time Odin's been in this situation. See, he did it to himself the first time so he could become something more. He hung on the tree for nine days and nights. Nobody brought him water then. Nobody brought him bread then. Till shrieking, he fell and earned the runes. <laughs> now he's in that situation again, and someone does show up. I don't know about you, but I've been in some tight spots sometime where, yeah, I wish there might have been somebody there to encourage me to stand up. And they weren't always around. So I had to figure out what part I had to let go so I don't lay in that cesspool of my own making anymore. This young boy, this child, and that's important to remember too, this is a child that brought to Odin a drink. And he's gonna make him king, he tells him that, but he's gonna give him a greater gift too, and that's all of his mythological knowledge. He's gonna tell him everything. He's gonna lay it on the line, this is what it is, this is where it's at, and just like him learning the runes, he's going to share some, some insight, some knowledge, the workings of the world, because he demonstrated kindness. What would happen if we were to demonstrate kindness to someone dealing with some tough spot in life? And that's an important thing to consider. The land is holy that lies hard by the gods and the elves together. And Thor shall ever and through time dwell till the gods, till the gods to destruction go. Edelir they call the place where Ul a hall for himself has set, and Alfheim the gods to Frey once gave as a tooth gift in ancient times. So he's telling this boy where the gods live. If we were a child and we were to be explained where the gods dwell, would that not help us? develop that kind of moral compass necessary to navigate this world and be more successful in helping others? I think so. A third home is there with silver thatched by the hands of the gracious gods. Blaskioff is it in days of old set by a god for himself. So that's the shelf of the slain. That's Odin's home in which his watchtower Gliskioff, the the, the whatever shelf. Gehring identifies this with Valhall, and as that is mentioned in stanza eight, he believes stanza six to be an interpolation. So it's repeated, this hall of the afterlife. They want to call it an interpolation, but it might be one of those important characteristics that this God also controls what happens after these men die. 
So Veritir means Lord of Men. Odin, the gift which Agnar receives, is Odin's mythological lore. So Thruthheim is the place of might, the place where Thor, the strongest of the gods, has his hall, Bilskinir. So Yidalir, the Udales, is the home of Ul, Ulr, Ul, Ulf, the archer among the gods, a son of Thor's wife Sif by another marriage. The wood of the yew tree was used for bows in the north, just as it was long afterwards in England. Alfheim is the home of the elves. So Frey, they gave it to Frey for the loss of a tooth. The tooth gift is the custom of making a present to a child when it cuts its first, first tooth, according to uh, Big Fusen still in vogue in Iceland. And that may have been in 1936, probably is still today. I mean, we, everybody has a tooth fairy, okay? Sokvebek is the fourth where cool waves flow and amid their murmur it stands. There daily do Odin and Saga drink in gladness from the cups of gold. This, this idea of Princess Saga, um, she's mentioned another time with regards to the lore of Princess Saga. They call her a princess in that. And it suggests that she might indeed be the daughter of Odin. Um, saga, they drink from cups of gold, in gladness from cups of gold. They're talking about these memories, these great things they've done, the good times they've had. Um, I don't think there's any, any more wonderful thing than to sit down with my oldest daughter and talk about those good times that we had together growing up, to laugh and to love and the things we made it through. And it's a real beautiful scene where cool waves flow. And amid their murmur, it stands there daily do Odin and Saga drink and gladness from cups of gold. People can talk about it all they want. But when that, if you're sitting around a campfire, you know, 10,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago, and these elders are telling you that Odin sits down with this Princess Saga and they talk about the good old days, that's something important to remember because we're trying to cultivate the right attitude among people who are going to be a member of this tribe. Are they going to remember the good times? See, because you can't be kind if you don't remember the good times, if you don't remember kindness that's been bestowed upon you. The fifth is Glassheim, and gold bright there stands about how all stretching wide. And there it is, oh, and each day choose the men who have fallen in the fight. <laughs> so there's Valhall, there's Vingolf, there's uh, Folkvanger. There's the three heavens for the warrior. And I've talked a lot about that. And that's men who have fallen in the fight. And that's pretty clear to me. That's not all of us. That's the men who have fallen in the fight. Um, easy it is to know for him who to Odin comes and beholds the hall. Its rafters are spears and its shields is its roof. On its benches are breastplates strewn. Easy it is to know for him to who Odin comes and beholds the hall. There hangs a wolf by the western door and over it an eagle hoofers. So Zvakbek is the, is the sink. These are the notes now is the sink means the sinking stream of this spot and of Saga who is said to live there. Not much is known. Uh, some people say she's a hypostasis of Frigg, but Snorri calls her a distinct goddess. And the name suggests some relation to history or storytelling. This is what they, just like I said. Glassheim is the place of joy, Odin's home, the greatest and most beautiful hall in the world. Valhalla is the hall of the slain. So he brings those men that die in the fight to this place of joy, the hall of the slain. Valhall is not the only hall where the slain heroes are brought by the Valkyries, but it is also a favorite home of Odin. The opening, let's see, the opening formula is abbreviated both manuscripts. So in both of the manuscripts, a wolf, probably the wolf and the eagle, were carved figures above the door. The sixth is Thramheim, where Thiazi dwelt, a giant of marvelous might. Now Skadi abides, the god's fair bride, in that home her father had. Know all this story fairly well. She picked a she picked a god who had the prettiest feet, and she thought it would be Balder. Turned out to be Njord. Apparently, walking on that beach is a nice soft sand, saltwater scrub. Give you pretty feet. <laughs> Didn't work out so well for him. Seventh is Bright the Blick. Balder has there for himself a dwelling set in the land I know that lies so fair, and from evil fate is free. That's a that's a important consideration to think. And Balder once again is this shining example of bright action. Even the land about his home is free of evil fate. Him and Bjorg is the eighth and Heimdall there over men hold sway. It is said in this well-built house does the warrior of heaven, the good meadly, the good mead gladly drink. 
So Heim, Thor is the warder of men, but Heimdall is the warder of heaven. This shining one is the warder of heaven. He's the one that keeps everything out of this, but he failed when he let three all-powerful female Jotuns into the golden age of Asgard. The ninth is Folkvang, where Freya decrees who shall have seats in the hall. The half of the dead each day does she choose, and half does Odin have. Now, I'm probably going to have to look into that, but this, uh, this idea, you know, it's just kind of a continuation that so much of a woman is involved in the, in the affairs of a man's life. Similarly, a woman, a man is involved in so many of the affairs of a woman's life, but it is a woman that brings a, a man into the world. She is responsible for his early upbringing. She becomes his wife once he leaves his mother and she's with him when he dies. And then he meets hell or a Valkyrie. It's a, another woman that escorts him into the afterlife. Freya gets half of those, half of those that fall in the fight. It's never really been explored, I don't think. I'm sure there's been some academic nonsense tossed about, but I don't think it really understands. You know, there's, I've talked about it a little bit. I'm not really gonna go into it here because it gets into quite a bit of men that haven't cut the, the apron strings from their mothers. So in the annotations, Thrymheim is the home of clamor. And on this mountain, the giant Theozzi built his home, the god or rather vain Njorth married Theozzi's daughter, Skadi. She wished to live in her father's hall among the mountains, while Neorth loved his home, Nuatan, by the sea. They agreed to compromise by spending nine nights in Thrymheim and then three in Nuatan, but neither could endure the surroundings of the other, other's home. So Skadi returned to Thrymheim while Neorth stayed at Nuatan. So Breathablock, the wide shining, the house in heaven, free from everything unclean in which Balder, the fairest and best of the gods, lived. Free from everything unclean. It's kind of an important thing. Think about his journey, though. After he leaves, he's got to take a, a wildly divergent path from the rest of the Aesir, fairly insulated from what's going on with all of these gods. Heimenbjorg is heaven's cliffs, the dwelling at the end of the bridge, the Bifrost, the rainbow, where Heimdall keeps watch against the coming of the giants. In this stands are the two function of Heimdall as the father of mankind, as in the Briggs Thula, and as the warder of gods, it seemed both to be mentioned, but the second line in the manuscript is apparently in bad shape and in the injection in, and in the additions is more or less conjectural. The good mead gladly drink is something that somebody kind of put in there because they really didn't understand what somebody had wrote. Over men hold sway to said in this well-built house does the warder of heaven, the good mead gladly drink. Makes sense though. Folkvang, the field of the folk. Here is situated Freya's hall, Sesamir, rich in seats. Freya, the sister of Frey, is the fairest of the goddess and the most kindly disposed to mankind, especially to lovers, half of the dead. Moguk has made it clear that Freya represents a confusion between two originally distinct divinities, the wife of Odin and the northern goddess of love. This passage appears to have in mind her attributes as Odin's wife. Story has the same confusion, but there's no reason why Freya, who was Freya's sister, should share the slain with Odin. So there's a lot of confusion there. People want to, and I see this a lot. People want to say Freya is a, she's a, some aspect or version of Frigg. She should have half, but I don't see why the hearth would have half of the slain. I think it would be more important. The more accurate consideration would be hell. Um, but that's, that's, that whole line has been posed, poisoned by the idea that she is Loki's daughter, though Grimm suggests that the further back you go, the more in prominence she begins to appear in all of his research, the etymologies he's done, which I'm more inclined to agree with. <laughs> the 10th is Glitnir. Its pillars are gold and its roof with silver is set. There most of the days does Forseti dwell and sets all strife at end. And that's, Forseti is Balder and Nana's son. And I've mentioned it many times in the Riggs Thule, you have a parent couple, a grandmother, a, a great grandmother, a grandmother and a mother, and they have a son and that son is presented with a bride. And then the children of that son and bride, the grandchildren of that couple, um, they're the ones that have are named after the characteristics necessary to build a society, to build a civilization. 
Well, in Asgard, it's much the same thing. And we see it most powerfully represented with Forseti, who is the grandson of Odin and Frigg. He is the son of Balder and Nanna. And he sets all strife to end. He is the judge. He is the one that establishes the kind of legal jurisprudence that allows free men to understand that this court system works in my favor. He's the one people should be appealing to with regards to legal matters, not Tyr. It says real clearly in the prose edit that Tyr is not known as a reconciler of men. And I see all kinds of dumbasses talking about, well, I'm, I'm going to go to court today. Well, if you do that, you're probably going to get what you deserve because Tyr's the one that sacrificed his hand for the benefit of the community. Glittner into the Shining, the home of Forseti, a god of whom we know nothing beyond what Snorri tells us. Forseti is the son of Balder and Anna, the daughter of Nep. All those who come to him with hard cases to settle go away satisfied. He is the best judge among gods and men. So the establishment of the law as a part of the community is just as important as Asgard as it is among men. And the Gothi of many of the communities or the Bard or the, or the Celtic versions of the Gothi, legal disputes were their responsibility because they had supposedly from on high, the understanding of what it means to settle a judgment with, settle its course or offer judgment with the wisdom of the divine. For Seti is an important part of that. That is a cornerstone of any powerful, successful civilization that free men might understand what it means to, to trust in their legal system. <laughs> the 11th is Noah Tan. There has New Earth for himself a dwelling set. The sinless ruler of men there sits in his temple timbered high. Noatan means ship's haven, the home of New York, who calms the waves. Now it also says that he has power over fire and water. That means he has some control over Ganungan Gap. At each end, you have fire and ice. The idea that this New York, who is, whose children literally mean abundance, fertility, all of those good things, prosperity, his children literally bless mankind. They're a part of the Aesir too. So when we look at these hostages that Odin secures for his tribe, for his community, he's picking the very best and the brightest to make sure that his tribe is as successful as it can be. He picks Njorth, who controls these seas, who controls fire and water and offers abundance. And his children literally are this, who everyone applies to or appeals to for abundance and prosperity in their life, for love. What more success could you have? <laughs> Filled with growing trees and high standing grass is, grass is Vithi, Vithar's land. But there did the son from his steed leap down with his father he fain would avenge. It's really the only time you'll ever hear about where Vithar comes from. His land is Vithi, the field with growing trees and high standing grass. Now, he's the one that slays the Fenris wolf after he kills, eats Odin great big shoe. And Eldrimir, Andrimir cooks, Samrimir's seething flesh, the best of few food, but few men know on what fare the warriors feast. That's the cook, the pot, and the meat for Valhalla. Freki and Gary does here father feed the far-famed fighter of old, but on wine alone does the weapon-decked god Odin forever live. Wine should probably be mead. The fermentation of grape was a fairly it was not common among the north. Over Mythgard, Hugin and Munin both each day set forth to fly. For Hugin I fear lest he come not home, but for Munin my care is more. That's an interesting thing that many Alzheimer's patients of today probably feel this very way. It's interesting that this would show up a thousand or more years ago when it's something that more and more of our elderly citizens are having to deal with. Alzheimer's stealing their thoughts. So it comes on here is that Hugin means thought and Munin means memory, the two ravens who sit on Odin's shoulder and fly forth daily to bring him news of the world. If you were, but for my memory, my care is more. Because we got to remember a lot of things. Anybody can think. A lot of people are told what to think. But if we can't remember, we can't learn. We can't develop. We can't grow. And these Alzheimer's patients are losing their ability to remember. They don't remember who, you, who the children are. They don't remember the people that they used to love them. They don't remember. This, that always strikes me as something very powerful, that something that old is talking about something that's affecting our society today. 
Loud roars thooned and thought Vidnir's fish, joyously fares in the flood. Hard does it seem to the host of the slain to wade the wild torrent. There Valgrind stands at the sacred gate, and behind are the holy doors. Old is the gate, but few there are who can tell how tightly it is locked. Five hundred doors and forty there are, I ween in Valhall's walls. Eight hundred fighters through one door fare, when to war with the wolf they go. Five hundred rooms and forty there are, I ween in Bilskimmer built. Of all the homes whose roofs I beheld, my sons the greatest me seemed. So Thund is the swollen or the roaring, the river surrounding Valhalla. So Thotvir's fish, presumably the sun, which was caught by the wolf's skull. Thotvir meaning the mighty wolf. Such a phrase is characteristic of all skaldic poetry is rather rare in the Edda. The last two lines refer to the attack on Valhalla by the people of hell. And Valgrind means the death gate, the outer gate of Valhalla. So there's some important characteristics about the afterlife, what comes out of it, what goes on, that it might be worth our while to take a look at. We remember Odin is pouring this knowledge into a 10-year-old boy. What is he going to be able to do with that as he becomes a king of his own kingdom? He's going to have a wise understanding of how to handle what's going on with his community. Okay. So he also talks about his son's home. So he talks about how great Valhalla is, but then he goes on to say, my son Thor has built something even greater. 500 rooms and 40 there are, we need Bill Skinner built. Of all the homes whose roofs I beheld, my son's the greatest me seem. So Thor has the greatest hall of all. Not Valhalla, not Vingolf, not Folkvanger, but Bill Skinner. Hythrin is the goat who stands by her father's hall, and the branches of Larry she bites. The pitcher she fills with the fair clear mead, ne'er fails the foaming drink. Akthrinir is the heart who stands by her father's hall, and the branches of Larry he bites. From his horns a stream into Virgilmere drops, thence all the rivers run. So that's the goat that eats of the leaves that provides the mead for here Father's Hall for Valhalla, and the heart who eats of the tree leaves of Yggdrasil, whose the, the, the water runs off his horns and into the bubbling cauldron drops. So Eichthrenir means the oak thorned, with antlered thorns, like an oak. This animal presumably represents the clouds, though I'm hard pressed to find that. Um, Although if you look, I posted something today, if you look at um, how important the horns of the ibex were, you, you, you'll see that a goat, when they talk about goat in this, they're not talking about like a farm animal like we're talking about. They're talking, when they're talking about the goats that pull Thor's chariot, they're not talking about, you know, some little fainting goat over here. They're talking about the ibex, the mountain goats, the European alpine ibex, of the scimitar horns, and it's, it's, it's documented in everything across Northern Europe and into Siberia. There's representations of that. So when they're talking about a goat, they're ta that's what they're talking about. This great, big, gigantic animal that just walks right up the side of a mountain. That's what they mean when they say goat. They're talking about the alpine uh, ibex. And I encourage you to look one of them up. They're an impressive beast. This is the animal that produces the meat. This is the animal, the heart, uh, the heart is the great deer. It could be an Irish elk for all I know, but that from its horn stream a river. Um, that's a wild, they're, they're probably worth a lot of research because that's an awfully wild thing to say. But her Bergomir, according to Snorri, this spring, the cauldron roaring or the bubbling cauldron was in the midst of Niflheim. So from the top of Yggdrasil to the midst of Niflheim, the world of darkness and the dead, although beneath the third root of the ash Yggdrasil, Snorri gives a list of the rivers flowing that's nearly identical with the one of the poem. So he's going to name all the rivers, and I'll probably butcher all these, but I'm going to say them anyway. Sith and Bith, Saken and Aiken, Sval and Fimbulthal, Gunthro and Fjorm, Rin and Renandi, Gipel and Gopal, Gomel and Gervamal, that flow through the field of the gods. So those rivers flow through Asgard. Then and Vin, Thol and Hol, Groth and Guthrin, Vino is one, Vegsvin is another, 
and thought Numa a third, night and not, none and home, slith and trith, silg and ilg, vith and von, von and strand, gyol and lipt, that go among men, and hence they fall to hell. So it starts in Niflheim, flows through Asgard, and ends in hell. But if we look at stanza 27 through stanza 35, the whole thing might be an interpolation. Boog calls stanza 27 to 30 an interpolation. Now, the problem with Boog is this 17th century author is the one that kind of originated this idea that the lore was Christianized. In the 17th century, if you were to suggest the idea that much of Christianity came from the ideas in the lore, why well, you would be burned at the stake as a witch. So he kind of put that out there, and like a thorn in the side, the damn, the damn idea is really stuck. You see, what you have to remember is that one is much older than the other. And much of Christian lore is an amalgamation of several different Middle Eastern cultures. For it to be successful in Europe, they're not going to be able to relate to the desert, are they? They're not going to be able to relate to dying of thirst standing in your front yard. <laughs> they're going to have to be some modifications made to it so that it would appeal to the people of Europe. So it would be familiar to them. There's certain radical concepts that take the very best of who you are and take it, take it outside of your body. So no longer will industriousness and self-reliance be sufficient. Now you're going to need grace and favor because the best and brightest of who you are, that permission has to be given from on high. That's 180 degrees from what we've been taught. So if you're going to go into a culture with such a radical concept, how are you going to convince these people that it's necessary or worth their while to go ahead and sacrifice the idea of what they could become and leave it to the permission of some parish priest? You have to make it a little bit familiar, aren't you? You're going to have to vilify the afterlife. You're going to have to make Helheim a dark and forbidding place. You're going to have to make the goddess of death an evil character. You're going to have to challenge the ideas of the halls of our ancestors. So you can't take the warrior's heaven. So Valhall, Vingalt, and Folkvanger remain. You're not going to steal a warrior's heaven. Those guys aren't going to give that up. They're not going to go out there and fight. Well, if, but you can challenge the idea of the halls of our ancestors and make hell seem like a dark and forbidding place. Snorri is guilty of this. Snorri is one of the ones that put that to paper and vilified what up to then had been a straw death's only reward would be to visit the halls of your ancestors. And that's where you really wanted to go. And that resided in hell. But it didn't always work because Balder sits in a high seat in Helheim. This shining example of perfection, the son of Odin and Frith, along with his chosen partner and mate, Nana, the daughter of Nod. So we've got some deciphering to do there. And all of the deciphering that we do, we have to look at it and say, how does that allow me to take what I'm looking at today and go and be something better? Can I sit here and play the victim? Can I indulge in righteous indignation? Can I substitute that kind of anger of being a victim when we were kings? Uh, and righteous indignation and use and confuse that for an idea of spirituality because many people do or should i begin to look at that and say you know what that doesn't make sense and i don't think any of my ancestors would use that would use it that way people will say that's unverified personal gnosis upg and there was a time that it was uh if somebody labeled you that it was just oh it's unverified personal gnosis um because it would challenge their ego and how right they thought they are with regards to their academic research. Um, but I think we need to be looking at some of that. At some point we got to ask ourselves, what does it cost me? What does it cost me to buy into that idea? How's that going to change who and what I am? Will I be less of somebody? Will I be not as important? What does it cost? It doesn't really cost you anything. If you want to, use something that sounds like it might work in your spiritual practice. If it doesn't work, eventually you'll cast it aside. If it doesn't move you forward in this word, eventually you'll get rid of it and it'll fall by the way. But when you sit there and stand a hard line based on, well, that's just you. Now, granted, there are some lunatics out here. This is a fringe element. There are some people that are batshit crazy that are come up with some nonsense and I've heard a bunch of it. But we can call it, I mean, 
I hate to say it, but Brene Brown, she's right. Speak truth to bullshit. <laughs> and that's an important thing to consider. It's time we do some of that. But I digress. We continue on with the river. Cormpton, Ormpton, Kerlogs, Twain, shall Thor each day wade through. When dooms to give, he forth shall go to the ash tree Yggdrasil. For heaven's bridge burns all in flame, and the sacred waters seethe. He's too, he's too big, man. He's too big to cross uh, Yggdrasil, uh, or to, to cross the Bifrost. So he has to wade the rivers to get to Yggdrasil, where they hold their royal court and determine the fates of men and all these other things. Glauth and Giller, Glare and Skythbrimir, Silf and Trop and Sinir, Gisil and Falafnir, Galtop and Letfidi. On these steeds the gods shall go when dooms to give each day they ride to the ash tree Yggdrasil. So these are the horses that the rest of the gods ride. So all the gods have a horse, but Sleipnir is not mentioned in that, which is interesting. Um, this stands a look. So the third root of the ash stands in heaven and beneath this root is a spring, which is very holy water and is called Earth's Well. There the gods have their judgment seat and thither, thither they ride each day over the Bifrost, which is also called the God's Bridge. Thor has to go on foot in the last days of the destruction when the bridge is burning. Another interpretation, however, is that when Thor leaves the heavens, when a thunderstorm is over, the rainbow bridge becomes hot in the sun. Nothing more is known of the river's name in this stanza and almost, and they're almost an interpolation from stanza 30. So there's some interesting characteristics of Thor traveling over that bridge and the rainbow and after the storm and all that nonsense. Now, Glath means joyous and uh, identified in the Skalds Karpamal, the skin faxi, the horse of the day. Um, Giller means golden. Glare means shining. Zvithgrimir means swift going. Silfen top means silver topped. Sinir means sinewy. Um, Gehring suggests it means gleaming. Falhof near the hollow hoofed. Gold top means gold top. This horse belongs to Heimdall. And uh, it's noteworthy because gold is one of the attributes of Heimdall's belongings because his teeth were of gold. And he was also called gold toothed. Letfiddy means light foot, but Sleipnir is not mentioned. So that's the name of the horses and what they mean. Three routes there are that three ways run neath the ash tree Yggdrasil. Neath the first lives hell. Neath the second, the frost giants. Neath the last are the lands of men. Bratatosk is a squirrel who shall run from the ash tree Yggdrasil. From above the words of the eagle he bears and tells him to the knife hog beneath. Bratatosk means the swift tusked. Um, he just runs up and down with the abusive language of the eagle and the dragon and just stirs up a bunch of shit all day long. Um, he represents the, un there's an idea that he represents the undying hatred between the sustaining and, and the destroying elements of the gods and the giants. Um, some people say it's kind of far-fetched, but it's pretty much how it goes. There's always those equal and opposing opposites that are competing for some kind of success. Ratatosk is a physical representation, or they, some people suggest he's a physical representation of that, the swift tusked, the fast talker. Four, heart, four hearts there are that the highest twigs nibble with necks bent back, Dane and Duvalin, Dunir and Dyrathor. Um, some people suggest that this, the four hearts um, are a late multiplication of the single heart mentioned in Standard 26. Just as, just as the list of dragons in standards of 34 seem to have been expanded out of Neithog, the only authentic dragon under the root of, a, of the ash. Um, so as, it, as the tale continued on, it began to grow. More serpents there are beneath the ash than an unwise ape would think. Going and mowing, graffit near sons, Grabak and Grafuluth, Ofnir and Zvafnir shall ever, methinks, gnaw at the twigs of the tree. That means the uh, their names mean uh, going and mowing. That's kind of obscure, but Grafitnir means the gnawing wolf. Grabuck means the grayback. Grafuluf means the field gnawer. Ofnir and Svafnir, the bewilderer and the sleep bringer. Um, 
Now, if we go on down, we'll see that O then gives himself two of these names. Hydrasil's ash, great evil suffers far more than men do know. The heart bites its top, its trunk is rotting, and Nighthawk gnaws beneath. Christ and mist, bring the horn at my will, Skaggled and Skoguld, Hild and Thruth, Lock and Hrifter, Gol and Garinol, Randgrith and Rathgriff, and Regenleaf, beer to the warrior's bring. That's the name of the Valkyries. Arabak and Alsvif, up shall drag the weary weight of the sun, but an iron cool have the kindly gods of yore set under their yokes. So, the names of the Valkyries, Christ means shaker, mist means mist. Skegeld means axe time, Skogel means raging, Hield means warrior, Thruth is might, and that may be Thor's daughter. Hlok means shrieking, Hirfjotjur, host fetter, Gaul means screaming, Garanyal, the spear bearer, Randgrith, the shield bearer, Rothgrith, uh, plan destroyer, Regenleaf, God's kin. That does not seem like a beautiful woman to me. I don't know how else to explain it. The earliest imagery of the Valkyries were akin to hags that fed off the dead in the battlefield. It wasn't until Wagner came along and began to make these Valkyries beautiful. Though, of course, we always have to pay attention to the idea of uh, Sigurd and Sigurdrifa, the victory bringer. Um, she did and was indeed beautiful. So they could be these powerful, beautiful women, much like Amazons for all I know, um, but those are their names. Um, Erok means early waker and Alasvith means all swift. Uh, these are the horses of the sun. Um, uh, there was a man called Hundufari who had two children. They were so fair and lovely that he called his son Manny and his daughter Sol. The gods were angry at this presumption and took the children and set them up in heaven, and they bade Sol drive the horses that drew the car of the sun, which the gods had made to light the world from the sparks which flew out of Muspelheim. The horses were called Alsvith and Auerbach, which means early waker and all swift. And under their yokes, the gods set two bellows to cool them, and in some songs, these are called the cold iron. You know, if you look at the Greek tragedy, you see the gods the Greek gods enact this kind of stuff all the time upon humanity. This is one of the few cases where you see the Norse gods um, become angry at the presumptionness of men and take, and take, these, take the children. In front of the sun does Valen stand the shield for the shining gods and there's a shield that protects her. Mountains and sea would be set in flames if it fell before the sun. There's a, a protection around the sun that, that keeps the world from burning up. Could be the magnetosphere for all I know. Wouldn't that be cool? Matter of fact, I might write something up to make it sound like that. <clears throat> Skull is the wolf that's ironwood fo follows the glittering god and the son of Hrothvanir. Hati awaits, the burning bride of heaven. Out of Ymir's flesh was fashioned the earth and the ocean out of his blood, of his bones, the hills, of his hair, the trees, of his skulls, the heavens hot. Zvelin means the cooling. Skull and Hati are the wolves that devour respectively the sun and the moon. The latter is son of Prophet near the mighty wolf, uh, Fenrir. Um, Fenrir appears as the thief. Um, rest of it is Ymir. Mythgarth, the gods from these eyebrows made and set for the sons of men. Out of his brain, the baleful clouds they made to move on high. His favor of Ul and all of the gods who first in flames will reach for the house can be seen by the sons of gods if the kettle aside were cast. In the days of old did Evaldi's son Skithblatnir fashion fair the best of ships for the bright god Frey, the noble son of Nior. So now we're getting some information. You gotta remember this is still being told to a 10 year old boy. Are we telling our children the same kind of information that will allow them to become something in this world? Because it's our job to look at all this stuff and say, okay, I can use this for this. I can use this for this. This is gonna help me do live this right action. This is going to give me an understanding of time. This is going to give me an understanding of the world I live in and the environment in which I exist. That's the primary reason for all of this. All of this allows a young person to understand and develop an interaction with the world in which they live. We live in a much different world than that. But as it looks like with that memory and thought and the onset of Alzheimer's for people, 
is there not a possibility that we might also use some of this information to exist in this world? Because I'll tell you that much of the information that we discuss will work from a molecular level all the way up to a cosmic level. That, sun, that shield, Svalin, that protects the earth from burning up. Who knows? Maybe it was a fancy name for the magnetosphere. Maybe they did understand what a solar wind was and the aurora borealis. Girder was a representation of the aurora borealis. That's what Frey, this solar deity, fell in love with. Um, so maybe there was an understanding. Who knows? Maybe we really are a species with amnesia. The best of trees must Yggdrasil be. Skithblat near the best of boats. Of all the gods is Odin the greatest and Slight near the best of steeds. Bifrost of bridges, Bragi of skalds, Hobrock of hawks, and the garm of hounds. To the race of gods my face have I raised and wished for aid have I waked. For to all the gods has the message gone that sit in eager seats that drink within eager's doors. When I wrote Eager's Feast, I put forth the idea that Loki represents a negative thought. He takes all of these positive images that we have of ourselves, and this one being comes in there, just as if we have, we're thinking we're having a good day, everything's going great, and we have one negative thought, and our day turns to shit. All right? With the same kind of effort, we have to push those negative thoughts out of our mind and keep these, we have to create an environment in which the gods might be welcome to sit our thought process, our minds, keeping our faith at the forefront of our thought process allows us to create an environment where these gods might feel comfortable and help us become what we're supposed to become. They work on physical, spiritual, mental level, all the way up to the divine interaction. We can't even begin to imagine what the inhalation of Odin might really be like. But right here, he tells us that to all the gods has the message gone that sit in eager seats that drink within eager doors. All of this information is being relayed to a thought process. Your mind is made up of 70% water. Everything that walks, lives, breathes, and crawls is made up of water. Nothing can live without it. And the gods choose to have their greatest feasts in the abundance of the ocean. They come down from the mountain and feast in the water. You are made mostly of water. Think about that. He's reminding this 10-year-old boy of where these prayers might go. To raise your head and, and, of the, and talk to the gods, where's that going to go? Well, it might well go to some far-off place under the ocean, or it might take root within your own thought process, in your mind, this great substrate of water that conducts electrical impulses. Something to think about. Will it help you cultivate a deeper faith? a more powerful, positive aspect to what you think about yourself and what you can accomplish? Well, it has for me. That's all I can say. And it might for you too. Grim is my name, Gangleri am I, Herjan and Hjombiri, Thek and Thrithi, Thuth and Uth, Helblindi and Hor, South and Zvipa, Saniktal, Hirtith and Tnaikr, Bilia, Balia, Bolvrik and Fjolnir, Grim and Grimnir, Glapsvith and Svjolfith, Sith Hot, Sith Keg, Sig Father, and Hnikuth. All Father, Val Father, Atrith, Farmatir, a single name have I never had since first among men I fared. Everybody has an image of what the divine looks like in their life. These are what the names mean. Grim is the hooded, Gangleri the wanderer, Herjan the ruler, Jalberi the helmet bearer, Thek the much loved. Thrithi the third. Thuth and Uth, both names defy guesswork. So two names of this great divine being defy guesswork. We can't even understand what it means. Hellblindy, hell blinder. Or Herblindy, the host blinder. Or the high one. Saith, the truthful. Zvipfal, the changing. Sanictal, the truth teller. Herti, glad of the host. Nyker, the overthrower. Biliag, the shifty-eyed, Beliag, the flaming-eyed, Bulwark, the doer of ill, Fjolnir, the many-shaped, Grimnir, the hooded, Glapswith, swift in deceit, Fjolvith, wide of wisdom, Sithoth, with broad hat, Sithkeg, the long-bearded, Sigfather, the father of victory, Snyketh, the overthrower, Falfather, father of the slain, 
Altrius, the writer, farmateer, the helper of cargoes, i.e. the god of sailors. Every aspect that we might think of Odin is listed in those names. A truth teller, a deceiver, an overthrower, a father of victory. There's a, there's a passage in the, uh, in the prose that says, his countenance was, much, was uh, handsome and much loved by many, but when he turned his head to look at his enemies, they feared, there was much fear in what they looked at. And there are the names that describe it. Much loved by his friends, terrifying countenance to his enemies. Perhaps they said we should be too. We should always express the beauty of who we are to those people that are closest to us, that we love and care for, but to our enemies, a terrifying countenance indeed should be expressed. Who are our enemies? In a world like today, it's not so cut and dried, is it? Grimnir, they call me in Geralt's Hall, as Asmund Yalk am I. Kialar I was when I went in a sledge at the council, Thror am I called. As Vithar I fare to the fight, Oski, Biflindi, Gafinjor and Omi, Gondolir and Harboth midst gods. So I deceived the giant Sokmenir old as Vithir and Zvithir, Vith, Zvithrir of Yor. Of Mithbitnir's son, the slayer I was when the famed one found his doom. Nothing is known of Asmund, of Odin's appearance as Jalk, or of the occasion when he went in a sledge. As Yalar, the ruler of kills, Thror and Vithyor are also of uncertain meaning. Oski is the god of wishes. Biflindi, the manly scripts vary widely in the form of this name. Hyafinhor, equally high. Omni, the shouter. Gondlir, the wand bearer. Harboth, the graybeard. You were still missing an awful lot of information, but just on that right there, that's a pretty powerful cat. <clears throat> Drunk they are, Gareth, too much didst thou drink. Much hast thou lost, for help no more from me or my heroes thou hast. And it's awfully the only place to be abandoned by the divine because of our own arrogance and our ego, because of fear, because we believed the words whispered into our ear by another, to be abandoned by the divine and find ourselves on our own. Small heed didst thou take to all that I told, and false were the words of thy friends. For now the sword of my friend I see that waits all wet with blood. The sword pierced body shall egg have soon, for thy life is ended at last. The mage are hostile, now oath and behold. Now come to me if thou canst. This is where he's fallen on his sword. You can't come to him. He can't do anything. He's done. Now am I oath and egg was I once, ere that did they call me Thund, Vak, and Skilfing, Volfuth, and Hropteer. Gaut and Yalk midst the gods, Ofnir and Zvafnir, and all me thinks are names for none but me. So he tells him who he is. Ig means the terrible. The maidens are the three norns. Um, Thund is the thunderer. Vak is the wakeful. Skilfing is the shaker. Volfoth the wonderful. Hropateer, the crier of the gods. And his son dies. Gaut is father. Ofnir and Svafnir. King Dareth set and had his sword on his knee half drawn from its sheath. But when he heard that Odin was come thither, then he rose up and sought to take Odin from the fire. The sword slipped from his hand and fell with the hilt down. The king stumbled and fell forward. The sword pierced him through and slew him. Then Odin vanished. But Agnar long ruled there as king. So I guess you need to remember that hospitality is important. You never know who's gonna show up on your door. Don't be an ass to people you don't understand. Show some kindness. You don't trust in the what's held in another man's heart. <laughs> I think that's all I got. That's the end of the story. Anybody have any questions? Well, if not, I'm going to go ahead and call it quits. Stop the recording. And I appreciate everyone joining me for this evening. Yeah, I've got to bow out. Um, I got to run you. to my mother's and provide a little medical care for her. So I'm okay. not going to get to make the after discussion tonight, but it's certainly, certainly good, Brian. I appreciate it as always. Thank I'll you, man. You I appreciate it. No problem, man. All right. We'll talk soon. Yes, sir. All right, guys. I appreciate everybody joining in. I appreciate everybody showing up.
if anybody, had any, if seriously, if there's anything, any question that you want to ask or want to talk about, and it doesn't have to, if it doesn't even have to apply to this, I'd be happy to uh, talk with you about any of it. Is the original copy? Say again. Okay, guys, I appreciate your time. May the gods bless. Good night.